We are obsessed, curious, distracted, and fixated. Like an accident on the side of the road, we can't look away. Something or someone has our attention. We are followers, and we are all following something. Sports teams, political candidates, natural disasters, breaking news, financial markets, technology trends, famous people. The list never ends. What is your curious obsession? Who or what are you following? Is Jesus on your list? Does he turn in and out of your thoughts? Is he a consideration of who you are and what you do? He should be. Let your heart catch fire with what it means to be a Jesus father. Your life will never be the same. Open your Bibles to the book of Luke, the book of Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> well, Happy New Year, everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's a couple of days late, but we're here. Amen. Glory to God. Luke chapter 5. And I told the guys Luke chapter 5, verse 36, but we are actually going to start in verse 33. In verse 33, my apologies, gentlemen. Luke chapter 5 and verse 33. When you got it, say so. And it says, Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is there? But the days will come when the bridegroom will take away from them, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new garment tears, makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy that you have shown us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your presence. And Holy Spirit, we ask that in these next few moments that you would speak to us, that you would open our ears to your voice, that we would hear you and that we would respond to you. Lord, I pray that you would build us up for your glory that you would tear down anything in us that needs to be torn down, but that you would build our faith in you stronger, that you would build our vision of you greater, and that you would build us up and send us out for your name's sake, Lord God. We thank you for this, and we pray this in Jesus' strong name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, we're going to start a new series as we are in this new year. And in this new series, it's called Disciples Follow. And as you saw our video, we're all following different things. I don't know what you follow, you know, what, what news outlets you follow, what, what groups of people you may follow, but we're all following different things. But we should be disciples of Jesus. And the number one thing or person that we should be following is Jesus. Amen. Amen. We should be following him. And the, the title of this series is Disciples Follow. And today we are going to look at a message I've entitled Good Enough. And the reason why I have entitled that is because we're all seeking, I don't know about you, but I know me and I'm thinking most people probably are seeking to be good enough. Whether it's at work, whether it's in marriage, whether it's as a child in a home with parents in school, whether it's as a parent, you are seeking to be good enough because you have come to terms with the fact that life is not perfect and neither are you. But what if, what if, just humor me for a moment, what if the God who created you didn't want you to settle for good enough? 
What if even though we are imperfect and we are fallen, he does not desire us to settle for good enough? Here's what I want you to think about this morning. God doesn't settle for good enough. Why should we? God doesn't settle for good enough. He he expects perfection, does he not? This is what God expects of us. He expects, I mean, Jesus makes it clear. He calls us to be perfect as the Father is perfect. That's what he expects of us. Though. That's pretty high, isn't it? Extra. I mean, the Father is perfect. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what he expects of us. He, he declares that in his word that we are to be perfect as the Father is perfect. We are to pursue perfection. And what we find here in this text is Jesus is coming in and he is just flipping the script on these people that are there in this moment. When you read the text, you see that Jesus comes or they, somebody comes to him here. And we know that it was actually John's disciples who came. It wasn't just the Pharisees who who came. So there, there, there was a group of folks, you know, John the Baptist had disciples and the Pharisees obviously had disciples and they all had certain religious requirements that they did, right? And they, you know, you know how sometimes I'll, I'll call the church into fasting and stuff like that. Well, they had like daily, weekly fast, right? So they fast like two times a week. I think it was on like Monday and Thursday is when they used to fast. It was, it was a religious routine that they fasted two times a week as if you were holy. See, I'm nice, right? When I call you to a fast, I'm like, if you, if you feel it, right? You know, and, and I give you like, hey, you know, if you want to fast, you can fast maybe one meal a day. If you want to fast, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not like the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees are like, if you're holy, if you're, if you're really holy, if you're really about it, about it with Jesus, come on now. If you're really in a relationship with him, if you're really in a commitment to God, if you really are a follower of them of Yahweh, right? Like if you really are that, then you'll fast twice a week. You'll be there in this fasting. And so fasting and, 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 and this weekly routine was part of their routine. But John the Baptist comes with it. Well, his disciples come and they come with some Pharisees and they ask Jesus, Hey, why is it that we fast and the Pharisees fast, but your, your disciples eat and drink? They were just hating on them. You know, you know how it feels when you fast, right? Yes. Well, if you've never fasted, it's you're hungry. Hallelujah. And, you know, and, and, you know, so some of you get hangry, right? You know, that, 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 that anger, that, that anger that comes from your hunger and other folks know when it, when it's time, it's time to eat. Hallelujah. And so when you are fasting, you're sacrificing your flesh, you're, 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 you're starving, you're hungry. I think they were just hungry and they were upset. They're like, yo, Jesus' disciples, like they got the easy way. Like we got to fast twice a week. Jesus' disciples don't fast ever. Every time we're fasting, we're walking around all gloomy. These guys are going, you know, in the fields, they're eating wheat. I don't know what they're, you know, they're just upset. So they asked this question. They asked him this question. Why is it that you guys are not fasting? They want to know what's going on. And what Jesus is doing is this, is that he enters into a religious atmosphere that is riddled with legalists and legalism. He, ent- he entered to the, into this atmosphere where because of the systems that have been set in place, what is happening is Jesus is there. And as he is, he, he's communicating with them because they are there. And you know what they're saying? Because of their religiosity, they're saying, hey, I'm good enough. And I'm better than most. And so we must be better than your disciples because they don't fast. But what Jesus was doing, he was flipping the script on them. And he was not just coming just to reform some religious system. He was coming to totally undo it and, and establish a new covenant. That's what, he's came, that's what he came to do. He comes, he, he comes to do something completely different. I love what Jesus goes on to say. Look at verse 34. He says, and he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? I just had the privilege of doing a a wedding of this beautiful couple that's in the back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Our newlyweds. Amen. Now, Ken, now, 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 it was a fun, I, had, I, I left at a certain point, but they were in there. They were dancing, having a good time as they should have been celebrating, you know, all that, right? Can you imagine telling everybody, hey, we're going to fast? 
It felt like that for a moment, right? Because there, <laughs> there was some mishaps with the food, right? Things happen at weddings, right? And so we thought we were fasting, but, but, but the depression that was there, people were getting hangry, you know? They were like, yo, these hors d'oeuvres are not holding. And, and so, but, but imagine if, if Marisol, Roly would have got, grabbed the mic and been like, hey guys, um, for this wedding, we're going we're gonna to fast instead of feast. That would have been depressing, right? Like, like nobody does. Nobody goes to a wedding and fast, right? Like everybody's expecting when I go to the reception that I'm going to have some food and feast and we're going to have a good time, right? And so this is the point that Jesus makes here. He's like, look, <laughs> you can't, you can't make people depressed when the bridegroom is there. Now, I'm, I, I can assure you when, when, when this beautiful couple left, Mom and dad had some sad moments. Not sad because they were depressed, but because, you know, it's just something that happens, glory to God. I, I got to admit, this was the first wedding in my entire life that I almost cried while I was doing the actual ceremony. I had to talk to myself while, while, while Ray was, was doing his vows. I was like, Jason, you better tighten up right now. <laughs> So I know if I was emotional, I know mom and dad, they, they, because what? Because the bridegroom was taken away. He's here today, glory to God, right? Amen. <laughs> he wasn't taken away forever, but, but he's, he, now he lives on his own and, and it's a total new family, right? So this is the picture that Jesus is pointing. There's going to come a day when the bridegroom is not going to be here, but right now it's time to rejoice. Right now, it's time to be excited, and it's time to recognize that the king is here, and it's time to realize what he is doing, because there's going to come a day. That's our days. Hello. The bridegroom is taken away, and we're waiting for his return. We're waiting for him to come back and get us. Amen. And so now we can be fasting and praying, and we can engage that way, but the fact is Jesus in this moment is, is totally trying to let them know, hey, I'm trying to do something new. You want me to be depressed. You want them to be depressed at the wrong moment because you're not in tune with what I am doing in the earth. I want you to know that as I've been preaching, as we've been praying, and as we've been seeking the Lord, we're believing that God, we know, listen, and this is something, and Minister Jonathan, I, I love his, his heart as, we're, as we've been praying, and, and, he is, and he's expressed this, and, and I mean, God, we know. This is not like maybe God wants to do something. No. There is no question in our minds, that God wants to move in a way. Now, here's what I want you to understand. He wants to move in a way like we have never seen, but I want you to know that, that I, I also do not believe that this is just going to be, it's going to be a great move, and then everybody in the world is going to get saved. No, 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 my friends. Because we are on a prophetic time clock, and the end is coming closer. That is not going to change. So while God is going to move in a mighty way, guess who else is going to rise up in opposition? There is an enemy that is not that, that is not going to be okay with the move of God. That is not going to he's not going to just sit back and just be like, "Okay, it's all good." Listen, the culture we live in has become so secular, has become so ungodly, has become so saturated in sin. The enemy's not just going to sit back. No. There are people that have given themselves as we saw in the book of Revelation and no matter what happens, guess what? They're not going to repent. That, 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 that's the days in which we live. That doesn't mean God is not moving. That doesn't mean revival is not here. That does not mean that God is not going to do something greater than we have ever seen. Church, we need to be awake to this reality. That's the reason why we cannot settle. God doesn't settle. Why should we? The first thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, we must recognize, we must recognize the, need the need for the new to prepare for it. We must recognize the need for the new to prepare for it. Look at verse 39 here. Verse 39, it says this, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. In some of your translation, it said the old is good. And so what, and, and so what has happened is they have had the old wine. And as they've had the old wine, they don't see the need for any new wine. They're okay with the, the, the brand that they've been drinking. Hello. 
They're okay with that. When so, you, know, you, you know, when you have like a certain restaurant, I don't know, you, you may have a certain restaurant that you like a certain thing from that place, right? Or, or for those of you that, that cook, right, you have a certain brand, right, of whatever, uh, of a specific sauce, right? Some of you, you, there's no brand. You make your own sauce, amen? I want an, an invitation to your house, glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. For the, the, I, I want invitations to all the houses, amen, amen, glory to God. Whether it's sauce from a jar or sauce that you made, I just want to come over and hang out with you. But here's the thing. <laughs> but you, you, you have, right, a certain, a particular sauce. My, my mother-in-law, she cooks great. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Right? And, and, and one day they were, they, they were making, I, I, I forget what it was, but it, it's um, a certain brand of vanilla extract. I don't know anything about baking. I was in Georgia and I went to the store and I got imitation vanilla extract. And, and I was eating it every morning like it was the real thing because I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm like, great, amen. It's going in my oatmeal, right? Whatever. But, but there was a discussion in, in my home about the particular vanilla extract. You, now nah, you got to use this one. I'm like, are you serious? Some of y'all are like, yes, Bishop, we're serious, amen. <laughs> I have, I'm surrounded by good cooks, if you cannot tell. Hallelujah. My mother, amazing cook. My grandmother, amazing cook. Glory to God. Mother-in-law, my mom. I mean, I'm just surrounded by these great cooks. Pray for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm trying to lose some weight in the new year. Amen. Amen. What Jesus says, though, is when these people are drinking the wine, right? They're drinking the wine. They've tasted what is good. They have their particular brand. And, not, and then in those times, it wasn't a particular brand. It was just the old wine, the wine that they had been drinking, the wine that had been fermented for them, that they had made, that wine that's there. It's there. It's the old wine. And so Jesus talking about new wine, they're like, well, we don't need new wine. We're good. We're, we're fine with the wine we have been drinking. The wine we've been drinking is what? Is good enough. Isn't that how we are? Not just with vanilla extract and stuff like that, but, <laughs> but with life, with spirituality. Bishop come talking about, we need to pray more, man. Come on, man. I'm doing other things on Wednesday. I got my favorite show ready to go. Pray, pray on, on Sunday morning at, at 8.45. No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I, I'll get here at 10. I'm good. We get, I, I get the worship when y'all start. I get here at 9.58 so I can come in and get a seat. So talk, we need more. Why? I'm good. It's good enough. Where, I'm, where I am is good enough. I need to change my life. I, I need to lay down my, I need to sacrifice. No, wait, no, 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 I'm good. Is that, that, that's how we are, right? You know, what, what, what I find is this, is that when life gets rough is when we seek God the most. And can I say something? And some of you are not going to like what I'm about to say. I believe this firmly that sometimes God sends. I didn't say aloud. I said sends. Sometimes he sends the storms to wake you up. Sometimes he allows them as well. But what does he do it for? Because he doesn't want you to settle. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't want, get, one of the greatest problems, I mean, I know there's a lot of problems with America. I know we got tons of them, but here's one of the greatest ones when it comes to Christianity. It's so easy to be a Christian. Anybody can be a Christian. Anyone can call themselves a Christian in America. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not like in China or something like that where you got to be underground. It's not like in a, in, in a Muslim country somewhere where you go, and, and, you, and if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to get excommunicated from the community, and you can potentially be killed for your faith. It's not like that over here. Over here, you just raise your hand, squeeze someone's hand. I don't know, whatever you do to say, well, I'm a Christian. Read a Bible once in a while. Maybe go to church. So I, I don't know. And, and now it's even easier, right? Because here's what COVID did for us. COVID made people just go away from buildings. So now you can be a Christian and just be behind a camera. I'm a Christian. We don't need a fellowship with, because we can't. I know. Y'all don't want to hear that. I know. We got a new variant, Bishop. You know, we got, I know, I know, I know. I know. I know. None of that changes the Bible. 
God did not stutter when he said, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. There's not some like little, you know, parentheses there that says, unless there's disease, unless there's sickness. I've told y'all before, listen, in the middle of this thing, if you got to wear a hazmat suit to come and hang out with us, please do it. I'll buy you the hazmat suit. Because I want to be with you. I want to be around. That, that's part of being scriptural, being biblical. But like I said, this is not a, to get a rant on COVID, right? I, I get it. Some of, listen, let me, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me keep it 100 with you. There's some of our brothers and sisters that are not here today. And the reason why we're so light when it's because, of, because they have COVID right now. And I hope that you are praying for them because I sent you a message. I hope you got it. And you are praying for them, for their recovery, that God would bring healing to them, that you would believe God to restore them completely and 100%, that you will be, like I've said before, be wise, don't be fearful. Be wise. Be wise, but also be biblical, be obedient to the scriptures that call you into relationship, into fellowship, into proximity with each other. That's what the scriptures call us to. And so we have to be wise in these areas. But, but, but anybody, the point is, I'm back, back to my point. I know you thought I forgot about it. I didn't. Anybody can call themselves a Christian today. What does it, what does it mean to follow Jesus? We're going to talk about that in a moment. Pastor Aldo, he touched on it last week. And we're going, we're going to dig, dig a little bit deeper into that. But, we see Jesus here. He is talking about the way people respond to new wine. I don't need it. I'm good. I'm okay where I'm at. But God calls us to more. He calls us to a higher place. One of the main issues with the Pharisees and the religious elite, even with John's disciples who were asking this question, was a lack of understanding of the radical nature of the new covenant and their need for it. Here's the thing. They didn't realize what Jesus was doing. Again, they all thought what? Jesus was the Messiah and he was going to come and he was going to disempower Rome and he was going to become the king. He was going to raise Israel up again. That's what they all thought. Pharisees, John's disciples, Jesus' disciples, everybody thought that's what the Messiah was coming to do. The, 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 the government was going to be on his shoulders. He was going to bring in this reign of peace and restoration and Jesus doesn't do it like that. He does not do it like that. He doesn't come in and do it. But this, this truth of being just relaxed and being okay with where we are, this seems to be true of every generation. What do we do? We become comfortable. We become used to good enough, not realizing that the Lord wants more for us. But hear me, he expects more of us. Let me say it again. He wants more for us, but he expects more of us. And when I say he wants more for us, don't get it twisted. I'm not talking about this name it and claim it prosperity garbage. That's not what I'm talking about. You're like, yes, the Lord wants a bigger house for me. I, is your house okay where you're at? <laughs> Just because Joe Schmo's got a bigger house doesn't mean you need a bigger house. I'm just saying. Oh, he's got, he's got a better car for me. Is your car good? Are you taking care of the car he gave you? Hello. Letting that thing run to the ground and you just not being faithful what he gave you. Come on now. Hmm, I don't know. Anyway. I'm not talking about that prosperity stuff. That, that's not what I mean by he wants. I mean he wants more of himself in your life. He wants more of him in you. He wants more of his fruit in you. He wants more of his spirit, his power. His, he wants more of himself in you. That's what he wants more of for, uh, for us. He expects more of us. He expects more of us. And here's the fact. It is not until we recognize our need for the new, in our case, more of him, that we'll begin to prepare ourselves for it. Church, we have, we, we have, to, we have to think about where we are. You know, if you, if you know people are coming over, you know what you do? Typically. <laughs> you, you, you try to make your house look like nobody really lives here. Hello. I always, I always joke with my wife. I'm like, babe, you know, people live here, right? Like we, like we live, I, 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 babe, I, you keep a clean house. It's not like it's, you know, but people live here, you know? So, you know, you have a son who has like 13, no, I'm just kidding. He has like three pairs of sneakers. He, they're everywhere. Hello. 
He got toys. He, I don't know why. He doesn't play in his room. He plays right on the counter that is cleaned at all times. And so if you ever catch us off guard, guess what? You're going to walk into a counter full of toys because that's his PlayStation. Hello. But that's good, right? It's better on the counter than in the room anyway, right? But, 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 but what we do is when we know someone's coming, we prepare. When we get shocked, we're just like, oh, and we still try to prepare. We try to be like, hold on a second. I'll be right there. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, these are facts, right? Like this is real. And so what we have to do is we have to recognize our need for more. We have to recognize that, that that's what I've been preaching for, for the end of the year and just trying to communicate, man, we need more of him. We need more of him, right? We just came out of Advent. By the way, we had a little discussion earlier today, you know, on the liturgical calendar. I just want to let you know this. You know that song, The 12 Days of Christmas? You know it starts the 25th, right? Yeah. December, right? So December 25th is the first day of Christmas, right? First day of Christmas. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, just, I'm not kidding about it. But, but seriously, I learned this just the other day because one of my buddies, I sent him a, a Merry Christmas thing like two days after Christmas. And he's like, you know, Merry second day of Christmas. And I'm like, what? And that's when I realized this. And so I just want you to know these are good because Christmas is not over yet. Hallelujah. But my point is this. Here's my point. My, the, the reason why I bring this up. Because when I talk about preaching about wanting, needing more of God, what, what is the whole point of Advent? The whole point of Advent, we light these candles to remind us about what? About what this season is really about. That this season is not about the gifts we get under the tree or not, but this season is really about the greatest gift that was given to man. That's what the church did to redeem this season. Nobody knows the actual birth date of Jesus. Come on now. But the church tried to redeem this day and this time. And so you know what the church did? Took it to the next level. And so now we have this moment where it's what? We need more of him. We need more of his hope. We need more of his joy. We need more of his love. We need more of his peace. We need more of him. Not not, not the Santa list that you have. You know, because even even grown folk have a Santa list. Come on now. My Santa list begins like in the early on in the year. Elena, you can ask her. I'm always like, babe, you know what I want for Christmas? <laughs> I'm like, the year starts and I'm like, babe, I got my gift for Father's Day. I got my gift for my birthday. I got my gifts for Christmas. Hallelujah. That's, uh, that, so we all, we all have the list, right? We just, we don't write him to Santa. We go to the person that we know that is going to get us the gifts. And now I have a daughter that has some money. I'm like, baby, you know what I want? Hallelujah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not, but the the point of Advent is to call us to this place where we are saying, God, we recognize the greatest gift. And we want more of you. We want more of you in this season. We want to be reminded that we have been given so much, we should be given to others. We have been given so much, we should want to bless other people. Parents, parents, teach your kids that. I'm still working on it. (laughs) It's tough. Because we have been so indoctrinated with this idea of Christmas and and it's all about the gifts we get. It's hard to teach them, hey man, let's give to some other people. Let's bless other people. Let's let let's do see that that's that's the idea of Advent, but it's a calling to us realizing, man, we need more of him. As Pastor Aldo preached to us last week and he communicated about living a life of surrender, a life of worship. It's, it's a reminder that, man, God requires more of us because he wants to give us more of himself. But are you good? Are you okay with where you are? We, we're not going to prepare if we're okay. That, that, that's the reason. Listen to me now. That's the reason why the church is in this spiritual lethargy that it's in because you know what? We're good. We're okay. Everything, everything is okay. The second thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say to contain the new, to contain the new. we must be renewed. To contain the new, we must be renewed. So what does Jesus do? Let's go back up to verse 36 here. Verse 36, Jesus gives two examples. He says, then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece 
from a new garment or an old, on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. So he gives us the first example of a new patch or a new garment. And then the second one in verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins and both are preserved. So Jesus gives us two examples here. First one is a, a new patch and the other one is new wine. Bottom line is this. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus didn't come to patch things up or refill us with new wine. That isn't it. Jesus came to bring a whole new garment and new wine to the, to the, to, to the atmosphere. That's what he came to do. He, he didn't come to refill someone's cup and say, hey, you know what? You like that wine. Let me just, <laughs> that's what we want. That's what we want. We want Jesus to fill our cup with what we want in it. We, 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 want, we want the old garment. You know, you know, though, you know, all of us, I don't know, some of you, maybe, I know me, you know, there, there's those clothes that you've just gotten so used to wearing them, they're just comfortable. They're not clothes you wear out anywhere. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but they're comfortable clothes, right? They might have some holes in places where, you know, hey, they're comfortable. You know, and, and you know what you'll do because they're comfortable? You'll just sew them up. You're going to keep them and, you know, you'll put a patch on it. That's what you want to do. Jesus is like, nobody does that. Because, number one, the patch is not going to match. Hello. You can't, you can't match the colors, right? You just can't do it. And then when you go and, and obviously you, you, you're, you're going to make the, the patch is going to tear and it's going to do what? It's going to damage the garment more. So that means you need a new garment completely. And then he gives this example of the wineskins. He's like, you know, the wine, nobody takes new, new wine, right? And pours it into old wineskins or else what? The skins burst and both of them ruined. Wasted wine, bursted wineskin. So Jesus is like, nope, that's not, it's not what it is. A new patch won't match and it will do dam more damage than good in time. And then the new wine requires a new wineskin with elasticity. It's got to stretch because what happens is when they pour the wine, see, it's not like this, right? Like this, the, these bottles, the bottles, you, you don't get wine in this bottle, but you know, you, 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 the wine doesn't stretch there. There's a process that happens. But in those days, the process happened right in the wineskin. So you know what they did? They took the wineskin, they poured the wine into the wineskin after they did what they did. And then guess what? It was going to ferment inside of there. And you know what that was happening? It was stretching and moving. And if it didn't have any more stretching, it, guess what? It was going to burst. And so, but, but isn't that, isn't that us? Aren't we like that? We're so rigid, right? We have our schedules. We have our plans, right? We have, we, we, everything. And then where, where, where's God in the midst of all of this? What about when God interrupts your plans? I never forget our, our youth pastor one time. He told, he told us he was on his way out to go and preach somewhere. And as he was getting ready to leave to go preach, someone showed up at his house that he was, I guess his mom or something like that, wanted him to minister to. And he was like, man, I got to go, mom. I got to go preach. I got to go minister. And as he was getting ready to leave, the Lord was like, listen, if you don't stop and minister to this person, I'm going to stop you from ministering in the places you want to minister. That's what he sensed in his heart. Because he realized this, he realized that in that moment, God brought that person into his life at that moment in a need, and God was going to use him, but he had a choice to either say, man, my, my schedule, that doesn't fit my schedule. That doesn't fit my plans. That's not going to work the way that I want it to. Wait a second. Wait a minute. Time out. Wait, 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 wait. Where's the Lord in our plans? Is it, can I ask you an honest question? You don't have to answer this. Is it okay for God to interrupt you? Is it okay for God to interrupt your plans? Is it okay for God to come in and say, hey, like he's not going to do like that. <laughs> but is it okay for, are you open like that to where you say, Lord, this day is yours. I have an agenda. I have things that I have planned to do. But Lord, this day is yours. I mean, do we wake up like that, right? 
Are, are, are we surrendered? Because here's what I know. What I know is that what God wants to do is not going to fit within our rigidity. It's not. What, what God wants to do is not going to fit within our agenda with our man-centered goals. And listen, I'm not saying they're bad goals. I'm just saying they a lot of times don't have anything to do with him. Are we willing to say, God, I'm here. I want you to be glorified in me. I want you to do what you want. I want to contain the new. I want to care. Do, do you want to carry the new to the world? Do you, do you want to carry his glory to the world? Do you want to carry, do you think the world needs his glory? That's my question. Do you think the world needs the power and presence of God? See, because Jesus says that nobody does this with this wine, verse 38, but new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. Which means that he's given hope that there can be renewal in these wineskins. There can be renewal in these wineskins. Let me tell you something about wineskins. I, I learned this a long time ago. You may have heard me share this before. I haven't preached from this text in a long time, but with wineskins, there is a way to make them new again. And the way that that happens is they take the wineskins after they have already drunk the wine that was inside the wineskins, they take it and they have to put the wine in water. They got to let it like soak for a while. And then after it soaks for a while, then somebody has to, somebody, somebody has to rub oil on the wineskin so that way they regain their elasticity, right? And that way they're able to stretch again. And guess what? It doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you dunk it in the water, put some oil and you're good. It's a process that has to take place. And, and here's the thing for us, if we're willing to take time, and I love the, 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 the parallels in that, right? The water, God's word is the water, right? It's, it's, it's called water. In, in the book of Ephesians, husbands are supposed to wash their wives in the water of the word. Amen? And so that means to me that God's word is like water. So if you want to become a person who is more flexible, guess what you need to do? Spend some time in God's word. Not just a little bit of time, not just a little, you know, one verse a day type thing. No, no, no. You need to spend some substantial time in the word of God, letting God wash you, letting God cleanse you, letting God fill you, letting God renew you by his word as he is speaking to you through his word. That's what needs to be happening. And then you know what happens as, as a result of you being in God's presence? The Holy Spirit, that anointing rubs on you. But listen, it takes time. Again, it's not just Sunday morning, you know, however long we've been together. No, no, no. It's you spending time in God's word, spending time in God's presence so the way God can renew you. So the way God can make you flexible for him. So you can become that person that God wants you to be, to be that vessel that can carry the new into this world. This world needs the new. Are y'all here? Yeah. Let me, let, let, let me say this, and I say this with a broken heart. This world has been worn out by the old wine. This world has been worn out by the old wine of the religion of back in the days that no longer has the same power and effect that it should have. And so we have to do what? We have to come back to that place and say, God, we want to be carriers of the new to this world because this world needs to encounter you. The third thing I'd ask you to repeat after me is this, say renewal, renewal. Is, an process is an ongoing process of repentance, of repentance. And, surrender. and surrender. You're already in the book of Luke. Please turn to Luke chapter nine. We're gonna look at verse 23. And this is what Pastor Aldo touched on last week. And I hope to dig in just a little bit more as we look at these three verses. Luke chapter nine, verse 23. When you got it, say so. And it says, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? We'll just read verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the Holy 
holy angels. And so here's what I want you to see is that Jesus is pointing to those who want to follow him. And as we're talking about following Jesus, that's what we opened up looking at. We're all following something. But when Jesus is talking to his, his, his would be disciples, because these are people that are there that are saying, Hey, we want to follow you. Jesus is saying, Okay, you want to follow me? Then this is what it costs to follow me. This is what it costs to follow me. These are, these are heavy words that Jesus is communicating. I'm always amazed at Jesus because he's, he's seemingly always trying to shrink the group of people that are following him. He's the absolute opposite to the church today. The church today is seeking for more people. Like, we want to see more people, right? We want to see more people come to church. We want to see more people saved. We want to see more people added. We were praying this morning. I was praying, God, as your word says, you added to your church daily. Those who are being saved, Lord, add to your church. But it's funny because when you look at Jesus' teaching, he is always communicating in a way that it seems like he wants people to leave. Oh, you want to follow me? Okay, let's talk about that. He's not like, oh, you want to, come on, let, let, let me, no, come on, let's, let, let's follow, let's, let's build our group. That isn't what Jesus is doing. He's like, you want to follow me? Okay, here's what has to happen. You need to deny yourself. Remember the rich young ruler? Like, let me tell you something. Every, and I can say this with sincerity, every pastor wants a rich guy in his church. Hello, somebody. Come on, if you got plans, you want somebody who's wealthy. I'm just being, I'm keeping it 100 with you, right? You want someone who's wealthy. What did Jesus do? Rich young ruler comes to him. Jesus is like, oh, you know, you want eternal life. Okay, cool. Jesus doesn't like lower the bar for the guy. <laughs> what does he do? He's like, hey, check this out. Go sell everything you have and then come follow me. He le- the guy walks away sad. He didn't start following Jesus. He doesn't start following him, right? I'm sure Jesus had things that he wanted to do. I'm sure Jesus had some needs there that that rich young ruler could have met, for, but that isn't what Jesus' heart was. Jesus wanted to make sure this guy really wanted to follow. So here's the thing. Do we really want to follow Jesus in 2022? Do we really want to follow him? See, this is my hope. My hope is that we say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want to follow you the way that you want to be followed. Jesus says clearly, he makes it crystal clear, if anyone desires, notice that, if anyone desires to come after me. We can't follow Jesus by force. Hello? If anyone desires to follow me, if anybody wants to follow me, if anybody wants to come after me, let him do what? He has to do some things. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You want to follow me? Deny yourself, carry your cross. What does that mean? I think we all know what it means to deny ourselves, right? Say no to something that you really want. I'm not going to watch that program. I'm not going to go to that event. I'm not going to eat that item. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hmm. That's what it means to deny yourself. To say no to the cravings of your heart. To say no to the things that you really, really, really want. To deny yourself. Not to deny someone else. To deny yourself. To say no to yourself. You know know who's the hardest person to say no to? It's you. (laughs) You can say no to everyone else. You can say, no, 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 no. But to you, you got to say no to you. Jesus says, you want to follow me? Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Then, then this next thing that to us, I don't think it really makes a lot of sense or it doesn't hit us, right? But back then, this hit different. That's what they say today, right? That hit different. When Jesus said, oh, if you want to follow me, take up your cross daily. That meant something completely different because they understood what it meant to carry a cross. See, when somebody was condemned to death, guess what? They had to carry their cross to their place of execution. And so what Jesus was saying is, hey, number one, deny yourself. Say no to those cravings, those desires. Say no to your desires, 100%. Say no to those and then take up your, every day when you wake up. 
I love Pastor Aldo pointed that out last week. He was like, not weekly, not monthly, no, nope. daily. Every day you wake up and you say, Lord, it's time to die. Hmm. Hmm. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That every day you're going to wake up and you're going to say, well, Lord, here it is. I'm here today. I know this is not joyful, right? <laughs> Great way to start the new year, Bishop. Just encourage us right away to die. To die. <laughs> I'm encouraging you to death. Hello. <laughs> but these are not my words. These are Jesus's words. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is what following Jesus looks like. It's not just getting a tattoo somewhere that says, I love Jesus. I'm fine with that. I mean, if that's your thing, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not down with that. I got one tattoo in my life and I'll never do it again. I'm just saying, I'm not down with the, the pain. Hello, I'm not, I'm not with it. Just keeping it 100 with you. I also ain't got the money for that. But anyway, that's another story. I've thought about tattoos. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, you know, because it's the cool thing to get tattoos. So I'm like, I could be that cool pastor, right? Get a tattoo and, you know, have a sleeve or something like that. I'm like, nah. I'm like, nah, man, it's just a lot of pain that I'm just not going to go through, you know? But anyway, I live vicariously through others. I'll leave it there. But here's the thing. I thought about it, but, but I'm not, but, but that's, but, but listen, I'm not, if, if, if that's your thing, that's your thing. That's between you and the Lord. But that's not what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to get some trinket. I'm going to get some earrings that have some crosses. Or I'm going to get a cross and, you know, I'm going to show people. No, no, no. Following Jesus looks like me denying myself by me saying no to my desires and by me waking up every day saying, Lord, I'm ready to die. This is what it means to follow Jesus. To follow him. It's an ongoing process. I said it. Renewal is an ongoing process of repentance and surrender, right? Talked about the oil, the water. As you're in God's word, what is happening when you're in God's word? You're looking in a mirror. And you know what you're doing? You're seeing, man, I don't look like Jesus. As a husband, I don't look like Jesus. If you're a wife, as a wife, I don't think I look like Jesus in these moments. As a parent, I don't, man, I'm not, I'm not reflecting Christ. As a child, I'm not reflecting Christ. As, as a citizen in the culture, I'm not reflecting Christ. So you know what I'm learning when I'm, when I'm in God's word? I'm learning of God's great love. I'm learning of God's grace. I'm learning of the gospel for sure. But I am also learning what God expects of me. And then what I am doing is I'm making a choice either to give into my flesh, not deny myself, or I say, you know what? I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to accept God's word as truth. I'm going to accept God's word as what he says, and then I'm going to carry my cross, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to do it every day. And when I get tired, I'm going to do it again. And when I stop carrying my cross and someone calls me to it, or I hear a message that is saying, man, you're not carrying your cross, I'm going to respond, and I'm going to repent, and I'm going to say, Lord, forgive me for relinquishing what I'm supposed to do which is to lay my life down, which is to carry the cross. So as you're soaking in the water of the word and being cleansed, that's what's happening, right? You're being purified by God's word. You're being empowered by God's spirit. And that way you can do what? That way you can be the carrier of the new. So you can carry what God wants you to carry. I love what, I love what one writer said. He said this, he said, denying yourself and taking up your cross is not so much a prerequisite to following Jesus, but it is more of a continuing characteristic of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Here's what he's not saying. He's not saying that in order for you to come to me, you got to do this, right? He's saying in order for you to follow me, you have to do this. So you come to me by grace. We should say amen to that. We come, to, we, we come to him with our good enough. We come to him with our imperfection. We come to him because of the cross that invites us into a relationship. We come to him because of that. But if I'm going to follow him, man, it's not, 
I'm not just coming to him to get a little blessing. I'm coming to him with my life. I'm coming to him laying my life down. I'm coming to him saying, Lord, it's no longer my life, it's your life. This is what Jesus communicates. But I want you to know that this text is not just about the present moment. It's also about the future. Because look what he goes on to say. He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. You want to keep your life? In eternity, you're going to lose it. Those are heavy words. You want, you want to keep living in, the, in, 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 in just you know, what's good enough for you? You want to keep living how you want to live? You want to keep in, living in sin? You want to keep living? Okay. You, you're going to preserve your life the way that you want it? He will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? What good is it to get everything this world has to offer but lose the one thing that matters? There is no benefit. So here's the question. I'm getting ready to wrap up here, but here's a couple of questions I want you to think about before I ask you the last question. Are you denying yourself daily? These are rhetorical. I want you to think about them. Think about your life. Today's January 2nd. Just, just replay all of last year. Just real quick, quick, quick replay. Would you, would you say that you denied yourself daily in 2021? When you look back at 2021, would you say that you were carrying your cross? Would you say that you were waking up daily saying, Lord, I'm ready to die? And actually meaning it, not just saying it, right? Because I, I don't know about you, but sometimes like I go to pray in, in the morning and then I get to the moment where I'm going to say certain prayers and I'm like, man, do I really want to say this? Am I going to mean it? You know, like sometimes I'm, I'm like not in a mood to like evangelize or witness to anyone. And I'm like, man, I got to pray, Lord, if, if you want me to witness to someone. And then I'm like, yeah, you need it. You meant that, right? But did you, but, but did you mean that? Not that you were carrying someone else's cross, because we want to, sometimes you want to carry other people's cross. Or even worse, we measure our cross compared to someone else's cross. Right? And sometimes, our cross is heavier than someone else's and we think it's unfair, right? Come on now, be for real. Sometimes, and, 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 and can, I, can I say this? Some moments our crosses are different, right? Because some moments they're really heavy, really difficult, different seasons in our lives. But God still says, carry your cross daily. Carry your cross. Don't compare your cross to someone else. Don't, don't, don't just, listen, we're supposed to bear each other's burdens, but that doesn't mean that you carry someone else's cross. You can help them. You can assist them. But we got to carry our cross. So here's my closing question. Are you ready to stop settling for substandard discipleship? Are you ready to stop settling for substandard discipleship? Anything less than denying yourself? Anything less than carrying your cross daily, anything less than that is substandard discipleship. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't want to settle for good enough anymore. It's painful to think about what, what he wants, but I know this, eternally, it's going to be great. I wish I could promise you that now, <laughs> that that cross is going to feel okay, I can't. And if it's really a cross, it's going to be bitter. It's going to be painful. But, but can I tell you something? Let me, let, let, let me encourage you. I know you're discouraged right now. Can I encourage you? His grace is so sufficient as you carry your cross. Because you know what? He never does. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You know, you know what happens when you decide to carry your cross? You experience him in an intimacy that you won't outside of that. I know, listen, listen, I know that, that, that it's, it seems like, man, just, I'm just not going to carry the cross. 
I'm not going to deny. I'm just going to enjoy life right like now. I'm going to enjoy what I have. I'm not going to deny myself. Because everything seems so good. But please be encouraged. His grace is sufficient in your weakness. His grace is real. His presence is real. There is nothing, listen, we sing this, there is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Unless you're filling the emptiness in your life with something else. Because then you know what happens? His presence doesn't matter that much. Remember, I remember growing up and, you know, we grew up and it's not like kids today. Like we weren't allowed to drink soda or anything at the table until we ate first. Thank God my mom is a good cook and my grandmother's a good cook and their food is not dry. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's tough to do that with dry food. I'm just saying. But you know why they told us that? Because we were going to get full of something else and not get the nutrition that we need. And you know what denying yourself is? Denying yourself is saying, I don't want anything else but his presence. Carrying your cross is saying, I don't want anything else but the presence of God to fill the void in my heart. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right where you are. And listen, this is between you and the Lord. But if you say, Lord, I want to no longer live a substandard discipleship. I don't, I don't want to live outside of that intimacy with you. If you say, Lord, forgive me for not denying myself. Forgive me for not carrying my cross. Forgive me for being so rigid with my life. If you say that before the Lord, just humble your heart before him right where you are. Father, we come with our hearts humbled in your presence in this moment. We ask you, God, forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for bowing to idols and allowing other things to fill the voids in our lives, God. Forgive us for not being willing to lay down our lives, for not being willing to, to take up our cross daily. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Lord, help us to be a people that are empty outside of your presence. Help us to be a people who hunger and thirst for more of you, God. Help us to be a people that desire to know you, who desire to walk with you in intimacy, God. Help us to be a people whose lives reflect what followers of Jesus look like. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just wanna say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes, thank you for the shares, thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word core faith to 73256 that is core faith one word to 73256 and then follow the prompts and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that god has given us and if you are supporting us financially i want to say thank you so much i pray that god will bless you abundantly god bless you hope to see you next week